It's amazing how the Lord changes the topic of your sermon when you first begin to study. This is about the third sermon that I've written for this day. And a lot of it had to do with talking to people. Everywhere I go, on every day, it's, it's rare that there's not a day that I don't meet with people, some that go to church and many who do not. One of the questions that I've been asking around as I've talked to people is, what do you think about Mother's Day? What do you do for Mother's Day? What church will you be at on Mother's Day? And those are the questions that I've been asking. It's interesting how uh, back when I was coming along, Mother's Day was uh, very specific. Uh, you'll remember that on Mother's Day, if your mother was still alive, you wore a red flower. And if she had passed away, you wore a white flower. And virtually every church on Mother's Day had Mother's Day programs and the kids would sing almost every year. And everybody went home feeling good about themselves and the celebration of mothers, uh, flowers and all the things that went along with that. Uh, but in talking with people over the past couple of weeks, I've seen a very distinct change in what Mother's Day means because many people are sad. Now, it used to be when growing up, if your mother had already passed on, you could talk about your mother being in heaven and what a glorious life she must be enjoying and things like that. But now people are not sure. People don't know the Lord. Well, there's several things that, that caught my eyes. I did some reading this week. One was a story of a letter that had been written by a young boy to his mother. And in that letter, uh, it was a card for Mother's Day that he wrote. And he wrote a little uh, note and he said, I was going to buy a better card with hearts of pink and red. But then I thought I'd rather spend the money on me instead. It's awfully hard to buy things when one's allowance is so small. So I guess you're pretty lucky that I got you anything at all. Happy Mother's Day. There I've said it. Now I'm done. So how about getting out of bed and fix my breakfast for your son? And he signed it. Uh, and then the mama wrote back a little note and said, I'm deeply moved, his mom said. And then the son said, well, did you notice the part about the allowance? Uh, I was also reading another little uh, blurb that uh, thought might uh, touch the heart of those of you that can uh, relate to this. There's a little story about a little boy who, who came into where his mom uh, was and announced that he had two pieces of candy. And the mama said, well, what are you going to do with the other one after you eat one? He said, well, I'm going to eat both of them thinking that maybe this was a teachable moment, she looked over at her son and said, don't you think that you ought to share the candy with your brother? And he said, well, I don't, I don't have enough to share, so I'm just going to eat both of them. And the mom said, well, here's a time when my child needs to learn a lesson. So she said, what do you think Jesus would do if he had two pieces of candy? And the little boy thought for a little while and he said, well, I think Jesus would probably make two more pieces of candy and give those to my brother. <laughs> you know, Billy Graham shared something that I thought was very funny back years ago. He was saying that his favorite story was about a husband uh, who, wasn't, uh, who wasn't very attentive to his wife. And one day he started to feel very guilty about not showing her the attention that he felt that she deserved the mother of his children, and he just hadn't shown her the attention. Um, so he showed up one, one day, all dressed up nicely at the door, and he was standing at the front door, rang the doorbell, and while the, the, his wife came to the door and he began to sing, I love you truly, truly dear. You remember that song? Sang that. And then in his hand, he had flowers and candy. And he stood there and handed the flowers and the candy to his wife, the mother of his children. And all of a sudden, she broke out in tears and cried. And she, he asked, what was wrong? And she said, oh, Harry, everything's gone wrong today. We had a leak in the plumbing. The kids are terrible. 
the house is a wreck, and now you come home drunk. <laughs> Billy Graham said that was his favorite story. Fellas, I think if we showed up one day with flowers and candy, the wife would want to know what we've been up to, right? So the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, something that I have run into a number of times this week in dealing with family situations, family problems that people are going through. And Paul very specifically said, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. One woman wrote something that bears repeating. She said, Mother's Day is such a wonderful day for so many women, but it'll be a sad day for some of us who have, who have tried so very hard to become a mother, but without success. To us, having a baby is a dream just out of our reach. And Mother's Day is a day of tears instead of joy. I've run into two or three of those situations this week. There are other people on Mother's Day that would consider Mother's Day is no more than a day of sadness, not a day of joy. But not many noticed uh, because uh, when you come up uh, with people who are sad on this day as opposed to happy on this day because... After all, Mother's Day is a time of celebration. It's a time of remembering. It's a time of honoring our moms. But times have changed. And Mother's Day isn't quite the celebration that it once was. Even as a child, I can remember, as I said, the flowers, a number of things. But rather, it's become rather sad for some folks, as I've run into this week. Maybe we do need to realize in the midst of all of our celebration here on Mother's Day that there's also people within our congregation and people that we run into outside of our church that see this day as a very sad moment in their life. But what does it mean to you today? What does Mother's Day mean to you today? I'm away from my mother today. Fortunately, we have Terry's mom with us today. When it comes to Father's Day, both of us have lost our father, so I can relate to having lost a parent. So the fact of the matter is, we come to a day like this, and we either rejoice knowing where our mom is and what she is enjoying, or because of family problems or whatnot, we have a very difficult time. I want you to notice, first of all, that Mother's Day isn't necessarily a happy day for everybody. Maybe your mother... Uh, your Mother's Day is tinged with sadness. Maybe you're here today, and because of mom having passed on, uh, it's a little sad for you today. And you're a long way from your mom. Uh, maybe she doesn't live in the same city, as I was talking with the uh, lady in my office this morning, who we mentioned in the special card. That's the one thing that she was very sad about, and that is that she couldn't get her mom to move down around Griffin uh, to be with her and uh, wasn't able to take care of her. And maybe that was your feelings today, or maybe your children uh, are just not able to be with you on this Mother's Day. There, uh, we find that, so, uh, that, that Mother's Day is a sad day for some people because there's so many miles that separate them from their children, from their family. And maybe you're sad today because your mom is getting old, and you're wondering what the future is going to hold. And you notice how fast, perhaps, that your mom is beginning to age. And her eyesight is not as sharp as it used to be. And maybe she stumbles and falls. Or maybe you're afraid that she's going to hurt herself. Perhaps her hearing is not what it ought to be or what it should have been or what it has been in times past. And you find yourself repeating things, perhaps, more than once. And you begin to realize that age is beginning to creep in. I can say that personally because I too have hearing problems and my wife says you're not young as you used to be. But the reality is that many of you have already gone through the problem of aging parents or the difficulty or the challenge that that brings into your life. And probably one of the hardest decisions that we had to make as a family was when my father, who had Alzheimer's, got to the point where he was not able to drive and to convince a man who had been so independent all of his life 
that he could not drive any longer was very, very difficult. Another was my brother who had a stroke in his 50s and had to put him in a nursing home. Those are hard decisions that families have to make, aren't they? Very difficult decisions. Uh, but there comes a time when perhaps we're not able to give the adequate care that our families need. There's a, there's a poem that I read years ago about an old mom in a, in a nursing home. And interestingly enough, when I visit nursing homes and I talk with many of the moms and dads that are there, much of, to their uh, difficulty, they haven't seen their children in a long time. Or they'll have a, a card, perhaps, from Christmases years ago, and they haven't seen their family since. But this mama wrote this poem. She's in a nursing home, and she said, What do you see, nurses? What do you see? What are you thinking when you're looking at me? A crabby old woman, not very wise, uncertain of habits and faraway eyes. I'm a small child of ten with a mother and a father, brothers and sisters who love one another. I'm a bride in her twenties. My heart gives a leap, remembering the vow I promised to keep. I'm a woman of thirty, my young uh, now grown fast, bound of every other with ties that should last. Now I'm 40. My, my children have grown and gone. My man is beside me to see I don't mourn. At 50, once more babies play around my knees. Again, we know children, my husband and me. And I'm an old woman now, and nature is cruel. Tis her jest to make old age like, uh, look like, make us look like a fool. The body it crumbles, grace and vigor depart. I'm weak, and there is an ache in my heart. But inside this old uh, carcass, a young girl still dwells. And now and again, my battered heart swells. I remember the joys, I remember the pain. And I'm loving and living life over again. I, th I think of the years, all too few, gone too fast, and accept the, the stark fact that nothing can last. So open your eyes, nurses, open and see. Not a crabby old woman, look closer, see me. Right? Joe came in and he said, don't get old. <laughs> don't get old. Every, I told him, I said, too late, I'm on the fringes. But you know, as we do get older, we remember back how things used to be. We miss some of those things. Some of them we may be glad that we don't have to tend to like we used to. But Mother's Day, for some, is an unhappy thing. Because your mother is growing old, or maybe you're growing old. And you have to learn to deal with life as it is right now. Some of you... Don't have your husband still by your side. Some of you don't have your parents by your side. One of the first funerals that, that Wayne and I attended when I became your pastor was David's mama. I still remember that, that service when uh, it was your aunt and your mama uh, in that funeral, wasn't it? And they had been together for so long and died similar at similar times and others that, and you think about your mom like that on days like this. Well, maybe Mother's Day is an unhappy time for you because of a broken relationship. Maybe sometimes uh, something's happened and your family ties have been broken and you, you don't have your family around you. Maybe you have children and you don't know where they are. Or perhaps you don't know what's happening in their lives. So there's a gnawing emptiness that you have to deal with and it's hard to do that. Maybe there's a severed relationship between because you and your parents no longer speak. Sometimes something happened between you and your mom or you and your dad, and now you feel hostility towards your parents or parents toward their children. We're hearing more and more today about children about child abuse. Children who were abused by their parents are now adults and they're abusing their children. And it's a sad situation. Maybe you're wondering to yourself, how in the world can I honor people who treated me so lousy when I was growing up and mistreated me as a child? 
How can I honor that mother or that father? Or maybe you're a parent and your children are gone and you say, well, I thought we were a good family, but now we're alienated from each other and I just don't know what to do. You see, the things that I'm talking about today are not off the top of my head. These are things that I have discussed with people in the last two weeks. Between child abuse and absent parents and absent children, these are real problems that people are facing, even on Mother's Day and every other day of the year. So maybe Mother's Day is unhappy for you because of an experience that you had. And you see, the family has gone through tremendous stress and, uh, and, uh, over the, the decades, things have changed. I thought about what family has been even in my lifetime, in my parents' lifetime. For example, if you're 75 years old or older, you grew up in the 1930s and the 1940s, People didn't expect much back then in those days because they were living through the Depression and there just wasn't much to go around. All the uh, people in that time, that age group, wanted back when they were a child was just a job and, and, and to be happy. They were happy to have a job or some way to be able to feed their family. And then war came and all these folks, 75 and older, all the family wanted was just to have peace in the world again afraid of what was coming over, uh, whether it's a Japanese sub or a German sub, just afraid of what was going to be in the United States. The father saw himself as the provider of the family. So he worked very hard. He worked long. He brought home a paycheck. He bought the groceries and he provided for his family. And the mom saw herself as a homemaker and one who took care of the children. And she was a faithful wife and she was a faithful mother. And that's what she wanted. And she felt completely satisfied and completely fulfilled. If you were born in the 50s and 60s, as Terry and I were, came along right on the front end of the woman's liberation movement. And you heard voices from women on the streets and on the radio and on TV as it began. My kids can't believe that we didn't have TV when I was a child. How did you live? And the first one we got was black and white, right? A little tiny screen. But the fact is that as you came along, you heard women saying and reading articles where they would say, Women, demand your rights. You ought to be treated equally in every way. Do away with the distinctions between men and women. And if you're a woman, that sounded pretty good. But you may have had mixed feelings. A part of you said, well, it would be nice to have a man to take care of me. I kind of like that. But a part of you also wanted to do your own thing. And now you're hearing people say, you ought to do your own thing. And from all of that, you began, came the philosophy, we really don't need men. What purpose do men spend or, or offer here in this world? If you were born in the 70s and the 80s, many women were publicly wondering if men had any real useful purpose at all. And you see, we've gone through these periods, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and now we're in the 21st century. We've gone through all of this, and it's caused great stress on the family because we don't know what our role should be. We don't know what the proper philosophy is. Some people would say, well, the Bible's a good book, but it doesn't teach anything for 2023. We, we learn what we learn from being a family or what we believe to be true. And we've given up with Scripture. We've given up with church. We've given up with following God's laws. Well, people are always sure if there are answers to questions. I found that to be true over the last few weeks of talking to people. They're just not sure that there are answers. And asking them, what do you think the solution to family problems is? They say, we don't believe there are any solutions to family problems. And that's sad. But I wonder if we don't just make our problems even greater than they have to be. I wonder if we don't make our problems bigger than they really are. And I wonder, too, if the solutions to family problems are not simpler than we see them to be. 
for that case, I want you to see the second thing that I wanted to share with you today. And that is that we can find the solutions to our problems in God's Word. Jesus said that the heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will not pass away. The Bible says that God never changes. God created the family. The family is God's creation, and God has given you what you need to have the best of families and the solution to every problem. Put a name to it. This is what I shared with those that I spoke with over the last couple of weeks. But you can find, and I say this because of my experience and my education and because of the fact that I have lived through uh, family life all of these years, I learned that the best solution to the difficulties that anyone has family-wise is found in the Scripture. You've heard me say so many times that the Bible is our book of faith and practice. Amen. Most time, though, people don't know what the Bible said. But we can find solutions in the Scripture. Solutions are found in two words. Two words. Attitude and action. Attitude and action. First of all, let's talk about attitude. I think tremendous healing could come in our homes, in our families, if we would take the proper attitude. What attitude? The Bible says, speak the truth in love. Amen. Speak the truth in love. For instance, we might begin by realizing that our parents weren't perfect. That's not a shocking statement to some of us. Your parents weren't perfect. Maybe we expected them to be perfect, but they weren't. And so we were disappointed that our parents weren't perfect. Maybe, for example, we might think that our children aren't perfect. When... Ernie and Glenda started having their grandbaby. I said, now you can't have the perfect grandchild. We've already got that one. And then my grandchild hit their twos and their threes and the imperfections began to come to the, to the skin surface. Well, you say every parent in all these years of pastoring, every parent that has a child just knows that this is the most angelic, perfect child that they've ever had. You know what I've found? God will send the next one to prove you don't know what you're talking about. There's always one kid that comes along that's not going to listen and not going to obey. If you only got one child, that's the one. But the fact is that we always feel like our children are never going to have the same problem as somebody else's children. We've got perfect children and they behave themselves and they listen and they're doing what's right and only to find out that our kids are not perfect either. That's shocking, isn't it? Every one of my children have called home and apologized for their childhood when they realize that their kids are just like they used to be. So, sometimes we think our children are perfect. Now comes the hardest one. You ready? Our parents weren't perfect. Our children weren't perfect. Here's the hard one. You have to admit to yourself, well, I'm not perfect either. That's the hard one. Because folks, I'm about as close as you can get. No, that's not, just ask my wife. You, she, she speaks the truth in love. You say, well, I'm not perfect either. I wasn't a perfect child. I wasn't a perfect parent. And so my children had imperfect parents just like I had imperfect parents. Sometimes it hurts to speak the truth. But the truth can also bring a healing in families. When we begin to speak the truth in love to each other, and we admit that our parents were not perfect and neither are we, when we tell our kids, your children are not perfect and neither were you, then we begin to speak the truth in love. There is a healing. If there are deep hurts, then we can talk about them if you're going to talk the truth. If you're going to close your mind to the truth, there's no solution. You have to deal like a caring family. If you can't be honest, you can't have an attitude of love. 
That's the first word. You must have the proper attitude. Speak the truth in love. But here's the action. Here's the action that will help every family to be able to have a healthy relationship. And it's given to us in our text. Paul said, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. There are three things in that verse that gives you the solution to family problems. The first one is seen in the highlighted scripture at the very first part of this verse. He said, be ye kind one to another. Be kind to each other. The truth can hurt. But when the truth is spoken in kindness, you don't hurt, it helps. You heal, and healing can begin. But it starts out by speaking the truth in kindness. We speak what we feel to be the truth, but we can be harsh and cruel. And our tongue gets set on fire from hell, as James says. And then our relationship is severed. The second thing he says, not only be ye kind one to another, but be ye tender-hearted, or literally in the Greek, with compassion. Be ye kind one another with compassion. And compassion means, I seek to understand you. I want to know what you're going through in your life. I want to understand where you're coming from. I put you, I put on your shoes. I walk in your footsteps for a while. Listen, folks, revolutionary things can happen in the home when parents begin to understand what their teenager is experiencing. Think about it. What is it like to be going through puberty? What is it like to feel the peer pressure of being a Christian in public education today? What must it be like not to be able to go out and drink and take drugs and 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 uh, and, and be promiscuous when all your friends say they're doing it and they're having a ball. Think of what it is to be a teenager. And before long, you'll be a little bit more compassionate in the steps that they have to take. If parents only knew all the stress and all the pressure that comes by being a young person today, growing up in the world today, we would be compassionate. What I mean? You would understand what they're going through. You would, you would feel what it's like to walk in their shoes. And, uh, you would be, uh, if you would understand not, uh, about what your teenagers are going through, but teenagers, if you would understand what it is to be a parent of teenagers in this day and age. Afraid that your kid will be killed in their away from home. Afraid that your child is going to make the wrong decision or that your child will end up with the wrong group or that your child will end up doing something, seeing the world only from this vantage point, not this vantage point. And you're concerned and you stay awake and you can't sleep and all you do is pray that, that God will take care of them. Teenager, you need to understand what it is to be a parent of a young person today. Or somehow we could just crawl into the flesh of an aging parent. If we could just get into the mind and the feeling and know what it is to be trapped in a body that no longer functions like it used to. It doesn't see the way it used to see. It doesn't hear the way it used to hear. It can't handle things that it used to handle with no no tension, no difficulty at all. If we could understand this, parent to young person, young person to parent, young adult to older adult, if we could just understand and have compassion and say, I know what you're experiencing. I feel what you feel. Then may I say to you, our family situations would take care of themselves. And finally, Paul says, forgiving one another. Now you're kind. Now you're compassionate. So now you need to learn to forgive. To forgive. Forget those things that have caused rifts in your family. 
Forget those things that have caused division and strain and forgive so that healing can take place and wounds can disappear. You know, Jesus said Himself, if we don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will our trespasses be forgiven us. Amen. This morning, I speak to you, not a conventional Mother's Day type message, but one that meets the needs of so many that I've talked to just in the past two weeks. And this morning, if you're a mom living with a beautiful little house in a quiet little neighborhood, and your spring flowers are in full bloom and your children are healthy, and you have a loving, supporting husband, then thank God for your blessings. Amen? Amen. Today is a happy day for a mom like that. Spring flowers, supportive husband, children behaving themselves. That makes for a happy Mother's Day. Thank the Lord. But not everybody fits into that mold. And I think it's important for those who hurt to know that we think about all of that and we pray for those who have lost their mom in recent years or perhaps are having difficulty in taking care of an elderly parent, or perhaps there's a riff in their family and the children don't come around and they don't get the phone calls and, and, they, and you haven't seen your grandchildren in so long. Folks, listen. God hasn't forgotten you either. Maybe you don't have the flowers and the, and the wonders of a perfect family, but if you don't and you're having trouble, you're having difficulty, God hasn't forgotten you even on this day either. And He wants this to be your day. He wants you to have a wonderful Mother's Day. He wants you to bring His healing into your life and into your home and into your family. And it can happen by being kind to one another. By being tender-hearted, which means compassionate. And by forgiving, forgive that child. And child, forgive that parent. Forgive that brother or that sister. Forgiving one another. Why? Because God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Amen. Hath forgiven you. What a great day we could have if every family would treat one another with those three things in mind. Amen? Amen? Divorce would be non-existent. Child abuse would be non-existent. Parents would be taken care of by children. Even if you had to put them into the nursing home, you'd be there all the time to visit with them and not just put them away. So many troubles that I heard about in the past two weeks could be handled with these three things. Keep them in mind, even during Mother's Day. Shall we stand?